Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for this webinar on Dutch women painters of the 17th century. My name is Bob Ottenhoff, and I'm a member of the Washington chapter of the Netherland America Foundation. For the last 100 years, the NAF has focused on funding educational exchanges for Dutch and American students and scholars, sponsoring cultural exchanges and fostering business ties between the US and the Netherlands. Today's webinar is one in a series of occasional talks and lectures the Washington chapter holds on civic, cultural, and historical topics. On May 19, we'll be holding our annual fundraising dinner where we'll be celebrating the accomplishments of three outstanding Dutch or Dutch American honorees and recognizing past American ambassadors to the Netherlands. If you'd like to learn more about the NAF or our Washington chapter, please go to our website, thenaf.org, or use the QR code found on this slide. It's now my honor to introduce Dr. Arthur K. Wheelock, Jr. He's the curator of Northern Baroque paintings at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and I might add a longtime friend of the NAF. Dr. Wheelock has lectured widely on Dutch and Flemish art and has written numerous articles, books, and catalogs. He's going to introduce today's webinar and his colleagues from the National Gallery participating in today's presentation. Arthur, welcome back to the NAF, and thank you to you and your colleagues for what promises to be a very interesting webinar. Bob, thank you so much for that introduction and telling us about NAF, and we are all thrilled that uh, we are, have this program, and we want to thank NAF for, for allowing it to happen. Um, I am going to be very, very brief about this. We have uh, a wonderful discussion about sounding her fame, the wonders of uh, discovering about women artists of the 17th century and the cultural uh, creative en endeavors of all of them. And, and to lead what the, the program basically is uh, divided into two, three segments. And the first is a discussions from by Ginny Trainer, who is the uh, associate curator of the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And Ginny is organizing an exhibition of women in the arts, the Dutch and Flemish women in the arts in the 17th century in 2025. <clears throat> so we'll hear about her plans and the exhibition um, with her and her associate in that project is Katie Altheser. Uh, and Katie uh, will be discussing a component of that exhibition, which is really focusing on women um, and connections to the science and, and inter interactions of women artists in the science. Um, and that, uh, that will be an overview of the program that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on and feature. And then um, subsequent to their discussions, um, we will have a four-way discussion with Frima Fox Hofrichter, um, who is well known to, I'm sure all of you as Professor Pratt and a great scholar of, of Dutch art and, and Judith Leister and women artists and, and all sorts of different elements of the 17th century. Um, so Frema and I and Jenny and Katie will then enter into a four-way discussion. And then we will ask um, all of you who are listening to join us in discussion. Anybody who has questions, please um, write them in the Q&A component and then I will try to find them and, and uh, enter into a discussion with, with everybody who can, can ask Jenny any of us questions that you have from the program. But uh, right now, let's get started um, with Ginny and Ginny Trainer. It'll tell us about her exhibition plans. Um, we are thrilled to have you, Ginny. Thank you so much for um, leading us in our in our this discussion today. Well, thank you, Arthur, for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen so everyone should be seeing that first slide now with the title of our talk today. Um, I would just like to reiterate um, my thanks to the NUF for allowing us this opportunity today. And um, I would also like to thank uh, my co-panelists, Arthur, Frema, and Katie. Um, we have, 
you know, this has occasioned us to have uh, some great conversations over the past few months, and I'm eternally uh, grateful for, for everybody's insights. So uh, I'd also like to personally thank the NAF for a grant that they gave me. This was years ago uh, when I was a PhD candidate studying under Arthur Wheelock at the University of Maryland. Um, and that grant allowed me to go to the Netherlands um, uh, with the Addingham Trust, and it was really a pivotal experience in my uh, research. So I am very grateful to the NAF for making that possible. And here we are, full circle today. Um, so I want to begin by showing you images of um, an exhibition I did in 2019 at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And I had the pleasure to present about this exhibition to the DC chapter of NAF uh, in person, if you remember what in-person meetings were, um, in the December of 2019. And this was an exhibition called Women Artists of the Dutch Golden Age. It included nine paintings, nine prints, and two books. So out of the 20 objects in that exhibition, 16 were from the museum's own collection. So it was a modestly sized ex exhibition. In the process of planning that exhibition, I was really surprised to learn that there had not been, as far as I could tell, a multi-artist exhibition like this of Dutch women artists of the era. So that one was the first. And what this exhibition demonstrated and why I am now working on a much larger iteration of it to open at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in late 2025, is that there were many more women artists working during the period known as the Golden Age than many people realize. And the works created by women during this era played a role in the artistic economy of the time. Now, I'd like to briefly illustrate the vicissitudes of the legacy of many women artists of the period, and indeed a lot of early modern women artists, a lot of historical women artists, uh, using perhaps the most well-known example, Judith Leister. And here you see her self-portrait on the left that hangs at the National Gallery of Art in Washington and a painting by her on the right that is part of the collection at the National Museum of Women in the Arts. So thanks to the scholarship of Frema Fox Hofrichter, who published a catalog raisonné of her work in 1989, Leister is the one woman artist that lovers of Dutch art are probably going to know. And for good reason, she was a master painter, literally. She belonged to the Guild of St. Luke in Harlem, which um, all professional artists had to be part of and she had her own students. She was noted and talked about um, in two contemporary sources during her lifetime. Yet after her death, until the late 19th century, like 1890s, her name was forgotten. And almost half of her now accepted works were attributed to other artists, all men and mostly Franz Halls. Now today, Leister is one of the few Dutch or Flemish women artists of the period to have had a monographic or a single artist exhibition that really focuses on uh, the work of one artist. And thanks to that exhibition today, many more people know about her. Now, while Leister may be a recognizable name to some, less so are the many other names of women who also produce visual art during this period. Um, and now I apologize in advance because I'm going to run through the next few slides rather quickly, but this is really just meant to uh, make a visual point, if you will. I'm going to run through a few um, names of other women who were active in the period. So we have printmaker Magdalena van der Passe, Flemish painter Michelina Vautier, or Vautier. Susanna van Steenwijk Gaspel, Christina Terborg, Cornelia de Rijk, and Maria Schalken. And that's just to name a few. 
So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the exhibition that we are planning, why I think it's necessary and what this exhibition will include. So my part of this presentation is very much um, kind of a bird's eye view of the project and not so much about the particulars of one artist or another. My colleague, Katie Altizer, will then present a bit more in depth on one of the themes of the exhibition and examine some of the artists and their works within that theme. So having a multi-artist exhibition or survey exhibition of women artists of this period accomplishes a few things that a single artist exhibition cannot. Firstly, it pokes a few holes in what I like to call the myth of exceptionalism. That is the idea that women artists during this time period were few and far between and or that they were somehow exceptionally gifted beyond uh, what the majority of women could accomplish. Instead, by considering a substantial group of artists who created works in a variety of mediums, a point that I will return to in just a moment, it can be demonstrated that women were an integral part of the artistic circles and economies of the time. Somewhat paradoxically, considering women artists as a group does not silo them into a monolithic category based solely on gender. Rather, it affords an opportunity for a nuanced consideration of each as an individual whose path was dictated by gender, yes, but also by the circumstances of her life, such as social status, economic need, and even personality. Now, there's plenty of material to mount an exhibition on women painters, printmakers of the period. But one thing I'm interested in doing in my curatorial practice is to expand our collective definition of what art is. The divisions between so-called high or fine art and what is frequently labeled craft, not surprisingly have historically fallen along gender as well as class lines with the male dominated fields of painting and sculpture being at the top of the artistic pyramid while pursuits like lace making and embroidery historically associated with women are at the bottom. So it's not just painters and printmakers I'm interested in considering as artists here. In order to demonstrate the true breadth of women's contributions to the artistic luxury economy of the 17th century Netherlands, the exhibition will also include works that have historically fallen outside of the narrow definition of fine art. Take, for example, a mode of artistic production that was highly regarded at the time, but has been excluded from most discussion of the art of the period, paper cutting. Joanna Curtin Block was a paper cutter, and I'm showing you her work on the left-hand side. She was a paper cutter of such talent that her work was collected at home in the Netherlands and abroad, and one of her works sold for more than Rembrandt's painting, The Night Watch. Elizabeth Ryberg was another renowned paper cutter. And although no works of hers survive, contemporary accounts tell us of her royal clientele. And here on the right, I'm showing you a 1696 painting by Rotterdam painter, Nicholas Huell, that may be a portrait of Ryberg holding an example of her extraordinary paper cutting. Or consider lace. Despite the ubiquitousness of lace in portraits of the time and the countless often idealized images of women making lace in Dutch painting, and here I'm just showing you two well-known examples, the women, and they were predominantly women, even girls, who actually made this incredibly expensive and technically challenging product are not typically considered in discussions of the art of the period. Although women of all classes produce lace, it was the lower class women, often, of, often orphan girls working collectively uh, in orphanages, made in houses, who produced the majority of lace for the luxury market. And to reinforce this connection between the so-called fine arts of painting, the uh, so-called applied or craft arts of the time, I'm showing you a portrait by Rembrandt in the Rijksmuseum and an extant example of one of those fantastic lace collars, also in their collection. So by exhibiting a wide array of media, including paintings, drawings, prints, paper cutting, glass etching, lace, embroidery, etc., 
This exhibition offers evidence that women were an integral and important part of the visual culture and artistic economy of the 17th and early 18th century Netherlands. We're planning on organizing the exhibition thematically between three topics. The first is training, which explores the different ways women came to their particular art. Something that I'm hoping will become clear and looking at this section is whether or not whether or not most women were trained by family members like fathers or brothers, as is so often stated about women artists. But I'd like to point out here that many men were also trained within the family as painting, printing, or any number of other number of trades were usually a family business. So to what extent was this true or, or more true for women? Uh, there are certainly examples of this, but then there are also examples like Judith Leister, who came from non-artistic families uh, and studied with professional masters. And an examination of women's training in other realms, uh, like lace making or embroidery, like you see here on the left, will also be included. And I hope that this will shed more light on the various paths women took in pursuit of these skills. The second theme is the status of the artist, which explores the concepts of professional and amateur as they relate to women artists. As the art historian Elizabeth Honig has observed, many women artists of the period, mostly of the upper classes, operated in a kind of gray zone between the professional sphere, which was usually occupied by those of a relatively lower social class and an amateur one. Anna Maria von Schormann, whose self-portrait you see on the left and who actually is the creator of all the works you see on the screen right now. Um, she's probably the preeminent example of this kind of artist. She was from a wealthy family and she tried her hand at everything, printing, paper cutting, wood carving, glass etching, and even calligraphy. And this was all in addition to her being the first woman at university in the Netherlands, her philosophical correspondence with Rene Descartes and her mastery of languages, including Hebrew, Arabic, Syriac, and Aramaic. Um, a little bit of a know-it-all in the best sense. And lastly, the theme of frontiers presents the intersection of women, art, and science in the 17th and early 18th century Netherlands. This is an incredibly rich topic with lots of wonderful artists, patrons, and natural philosophers. And we'll hear a bit more about this in just a moment. These themes are intentionally broad to allow for the inclusion of various objects within each. So rather than segregating items according to the method of production, you know, exhibiting all the paintings together and all the drawings together and all the lace together, this format allows for fuller understanding of the context in which the works were created and provides new ways for considering their relationships to one another. It also actively works against these ingrained hierarchies of artworks that we have and therefore creates a different space for thinking about them. Now, as promised, we will hear a bit more about that last theme, Frontiers, that explores the fascinating connection between women art and science from my colleague Katie Altizer. She's going to give us some examples of what nuances can be teased out when we consider women working at these intersections as a group rather than individually. Katie? Thank you. The premise of the frontiers section of the exhibition is that women artists were a vital part of artistic and scientific networks and that they actively participated in the observation of the natural world and the dissemination of scientific knowledge through their art, forging successful careers to become integral participants in a large cultural network that included artists, intellectuals, scientists, and collectors. Recent scholarly attention has begun to exam examine women at the intersection of art and science in this period. Focused heavily on Maria Sibylla Marion, an artist and entomologist, they have also brought attention to scientific illustrators, Alita Vitos and Maria Monix, as well as botanist and collector Agnes Block. Maria Sibylla Marion wholly participated in scientific discovery. Between 1699 and 1701, Marion conducted research on insects in the Dutch colony of Suriname in South America. With this research, she produced a book which helped prove the metamorphosis of insects. 
the title page of which we see here. In this influential volume, Marion recorded her observations with meticulous, richly rendered illustrations. The expansion of European knowledge of global plants and animals depended on colonial trade and commerce. Merchants acquired plants through contacts in the colonies. Botanists in Amsterdam then cultivated the plants for study and classification. The influx of plants into Amsterdam and the founding of a research garden called the Hortus Medicus gave botanical artists opportunities through commissions. For example, Alida Vitos and Maria Monix, along with Monix's father Jan, were among the artists hired to illustrate the rare plants at the Hortus Medicus. Of the 420 total illustrations in this so-called Monix Atlas, Alida Vitos produced 13 and Maria Monix produced 101. Here we can see an example by Maria Monix uh, depicting what is usually uh, commonly called a forget-me-not. Maria Sibylla Marion, Alida Vitos, and Maria Monix were also among the artists commissioned by the botanist and collector Agnes Block. Block correspondent, let's see if we have a slide here. Um, Bloch corresponded with scientists across Europe and was involved in acquiring plants for the Hortus Medicus. She also developed her own plant collection at her country estate at Fiverrhoff, which we can see here complete with what is most likely her greenhouse in the background um, to the left and um, the pineapple, which she famously cultivated. She hired Marion, Vitos, Monix, and other artists, male as well as female, to illustrate the plants in her collection. In this beautiful example of a commission for Block by Alida Vitos at the Morgan Library, the artist has captured the appearance of the flower as though it rests alive on the sheet of paper on which it is depicted. In the commissions for Block and the Hortus Medicus, these artists worked alongside male colleagues to produce their scientific commissions. These women were not fringe artists, rather they were active at the center of Amsterdam's scientific and artistic community. Like men, they were actively involved in producing art that functioned as a luxury item for collectors and that depicted the plant accurately for the purpose of codifying and disseminating knowledge. Our exhibition will feature Marion, Bittos, Monix, and Bloch to show their contributions to the history of science. But it will also expand the scope of the genres exhibited within the framework of women, art, and science. Showing that the major themes evident with these botanical illustrators can provide a framework for understanding works by women, oil painters. I will briefly examine two of these artists Clara Peters and Rachel Rouse, as examples of how women artists from the beginning and end of the 17th century carefully observed the natural world and referenced current scientific thought as it developed over the course of the century. On the surface, Clara Peters and Rachel Rouse would seem to have little in common beyond being women painters of floral still lives, of still lives, excuse me. Clara Peters was active between 1607 and 1621 in Antwerp. She is known for her depictions of elegant tables, as you can see here on this, in this typical example on the left from the Prado. Meanwhile, Rachel Rouse was active much later, from the 1680s to 1750. Famous for her vibrant floral still lifes, Rachel Rouse worked in Amsterdam, The Hague, and in Dusseldorf, where she was court painter to the elector Palatine. Although Peters is not usually discussed in scientific terms, one work suggests that she may have had greater contact with contemporary science than previously appreciated. This painting, now at the National Gallery of Art, depicts a glass filled with a small nosegay. Around her precisely rendered still life composition is a seemingly unique feature, the paper-like surround on which rests a number of insects, including dragonflies, beetle, and fly, so lifelike that they seem to have crawled out of our world and onto its surface. 
With its sensitive observation of light, flowers, and insects, this work situates painters within the context of the Low Countries influential botanists who are carefully studying the rare plants Europeans had begun to acquire through trade. This painting was likely commissioned by a collector with scientific interests. The copper support of Pater's work suggests that this painting may have been intended for a collector's cabinet full of rarities, possibly including insects. Important publications depicting insects and plants were influential in this community, uh, such as this one by Jakob Hufnagel. As we can see in this print, Pater's treatment of the insects with their delicate illusionistic shadows may indicate knowledge of this publication. The underlying scientific naturalism evident in Clara Pater's intimate copper painting is not limited to her careful observation of the flowers and insects, but is also evident in her careful rendering of the optical effects of light as it passes through glass and water. Her ability to capture these effects allowed her to create works that had a remarkable appearance of reality. Rachel Rouse, active in the North almost a century later than Clara Peters, similarly fascinated collectors and connoisseurs. In the decades between Peters and Rouse, fascination with science had only increased. Over the century, intellectuals in Leiden and Amsterdam developed links with scientists across Europe and Britain in a transnational network of scientific thinkers. This luscious still life from the late 1680s suggests Rouse's connection to this scientific network. In this image, poppies, roses, carnations, and other flowers encircle each other in this dynamic, thriving bouquet. Like Peters, Rouse gives attention to the individual properties of each blossom, which are depicted with such lifelikeness that they seem to grow toward the light in the viewer's face. Rouse has also populated her painting with insects, including butterflies, beetles, and a spider, um, details of which you can see here. The lifelike floral arrangement and accurate depiction of insects places her within a scientific community at a moment when investigations into the life cycles of insects were the subject of cutting edge research. And this is the same context in which about 20 years later, Maria Sibylla Marion would travel to Suriname and publish her metamorphosis. Rouse's familial connection to Amsterdam's scientific network is well known. Her father, Frederick Rouse, was an important anatomist, obstetrician, and botanist who lectured at the Hortus Medicus and was also fascinated by insects. Rachel Rouse is likely to have been familiar with the Hortus through her father and was likely familiar with his professional contacts. Illustrations from a treatise on insects and amphibians by Jan Smarmerdam, a scientist and acquaintance of Frederick Rouse, provide an example of the types of closely observed illustrations that were circulating in Amsterdam among those in Rachel Rouse's social circle. Although active in different eras and a century apart, Peters and Rouse both tapped into a thriving market for paintings as luxury goods that reflected the era's interest in scientific observation. The themes of discovery, luxury, transformation, and knowledge do not just apply to scientific illustrators. They are also crucial to our understanding of women oil painters of the period. Although not normally exhibited together, Displaying works by Peters and Rausch, together with these works of scientific illustration by Marion, Fittos, and Monix, allows us to see broad interconnections between the ways in which these artists participated in their scientific and artistic communities. These connections give us just a glimpse into the kinds of questions we will explore as we seek to bring the experiences of Dutch women artists into the public conversation with this exhibition. And it is these questions that we will now discuss together in conversation with Arthur Wheelock and Frima fox Wolferter. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, um, Ginny and Katie. I think those were wonderful discussions and uh, we are uh, lots of things to talk about, lots of 
thoughts and um I have the first question, Arthur. And Frim, <laughs> thank Frim has got the first question. It sounds like yes. she's um, more on top I of this than uh, Katie. And and Ginny, why don't you take off your mute things so that we we can uh, have answers? <laughs> um, this was really an amazing display of uh, very talented women from the early part of the century all the way through the end and even beyond that. Um, I counted 16 uh, names of women artists. I know that there are more, but also there are many who are still anonymous uh, to us. But of the ones we know, can you speak to whether they knew each other? Um, did they collect each other's work? Um, was there any sense of a community uh, between them? I mean, what, what do we know about any interactions? Yeah, Katie, do you wanna go ahead and... and um answer that to, sure. to start with, because I think you illustrated some of that um, in your section of the talk. For sure. I think um, probably the most now well-known example of, well, indication of a community of artists um, is centered around Agnes Block, the patron and collector. She had several women artists who worked for her um, on her Bloom book. And so, um, as I'm sure you know, Maria Monix, um, Maria Sibylla Marion, Alita Vitos, um, all of these um, artists are working together with her and um, as I discussed. But I think um, also there are other indications of connections um, between those artists and um, other artists um, through kind of their training and um, other contacts. So, for example, um, another artist to work for Block was Otto Marcius von Schriek. He um, worked on her Bloom book. He um, was closely involved with her. She commissioned him. Um, and he uh, knew Jan Spammerdam, um, who knew Frederick Rouse, who knew, of course, Rocco Rouse. Um, so there are all these kind of interconnections there um, in the scientific community. And then there are other examples um, of artists who collect uh, works by other women artists. Um, for example, Katharina Bacher, who's a, an artist herself, um, had a very impressive collection um, and hopefully her work will be exhibited in this exhibition. Um, we know that she owned um, at least two works by Rachel Rouse. So there are many examples of that type of network. Um, and I don't know if Jenny has more to add to that as well, but this is exactly the kind of interconnections that we're hoping can be explored more fully in the exhibition. Yeah, to that, I would just add, um, and I think, Prima, you and Arthur know this very well too, you know, the world was a much smaller place in the 17th century in the Netherlands, right? There were, there were fewer people um, and, you know, many artists knew each other and, and operated in these circles. But I think it, it, it is interesting when we're, you know, looking at women in particular. Um, and one connection I found to be very interesting was um, Anna Maria von Schurman, who did, you know, so many different works and so many materials and kind of positioned herself as a, um, you know, a self-taught artist, um, which she was in a way, but there's evidence that she actually studied printmaking with Magdalena von der Passa, um, who came from a family of printmakers. So um, I think, you know, as we as we go on um, with the research for this exhibition, we're gonna uncover a lot more of these connections too. I see that um, Betsy from the National Gallery of Art uh, did mention in a chat just now that there was a community of women artists in Zwolle. So um, that's interesting because I was wondering when we talk about these, uh, the women, the um, botanical illustrators who work for, um, for Block, uh, but they, they worked as a community. I don't think they really, I don't think that they really worked together. I mean, they might have known who else was, um, you know, also got commissions or maybe they, they didn't. But there isn't, I think when we think about working together, it's as if, you know, we're all in the same room or on the same Zoom. But um, I think they, they actually were separate 
Um, so there's a chance that they they didn't know each other unless you know Block actually um, introduced them. Um, but I don't know that there. Do we have a sense of where some of these artists were working? If there's a community in Zwolle, is there are there enough artists just in Amsterdam or women artists in Amsterdam or um, I know not in Harlem, but. Do you, have any, is, do you think most of those were um, Amsterdam artists, the um, the botanical illustrators? It seems like most of them um, were in and around Amsterdam. Um, and then of course, you know, working for, for Agnes Block um, out at her Biberhof estate, which was not too far outside of Amsterdam. Um, I, I would like to mention here, um, because I, I see some comments in the chat and, um, you know, I, there, there have been, there's been amazing work done on many of these women artists um, by scholars in the field. Um, so Catherine Powell's work on um, Agnes Block is tremendous. Martha Moffat Peacock's work on, on Joanna Curtin Block, the paper cutter. Um, and so what we're trying to do with this exhibition is to kind of translate the wonderful scholarship that's been done um, on women of this period, even in the past 10, 15 years, and um, bring it to the public, right? Bring it to life in an exhibition. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about um, communities of women working together in the, in the past um, and, and the networks that they had and of, you know, thinking about it, how we work today, again, and, um, you know, sharing knowledge and, and uh, collaborating and help, helping each other out. Yeah, I think it will be great because as you pointed out, there's a lot of work on individual artists, but then um, we haven't really seen them together. And I think especially um, in the way you um, created sections for the exhibition, you'll be able to see those connections in, in training um, or a frontiers that, you know, Katie spoke about. So um, yeah, if you just did it um, chronologically or by subject, I think you even mentioned that, Jenny, if you did it by subject, then it would be, I think, a little boring and the last <laughs> four rooms would just be botanical illustrations. Um, I should say yes. it's different from the women artists in Italy, where there's an exhibition recently going around, um, the Artemisia Gentileschi, and which is more figural painting, mm -hmm. uh, religious painting, history painting, portraits. And, um, and I think in the North, it's a different tradition. Mm -hmm. And maybe I think Arthur wants to speak to that. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I think this has been fascinating and we're getting obviously a lot of questions on chat and I'm um, we'll try to hold off and, and to uh, exploring those a bit and some of them uh, maybe are so relevant to our discussion now that maybe we need to get into their broader um, questions but one thing I did want to um, a bit the miss I think it ties into what you've been talking about the the the, the um, structure of your exhibition that you've laid out Ginny um, with three different categories, training, status, and frontiers. I think it's a very interesting way to go about it. Um, and there are lots of questions there. And one of the things that you mentioned, a lot of women artists trained within the family, um, as did men. Um, if you didn't train within the family, then your parents had to probably pay for um, an apprenticeship someplace or other. So it really is a, a bit, uh, an interesting question of family um, desire to have their daughter um, enter into the art profession in, in some capacity where you actually have professional training. Um, and I don't know how you ever you know, find out more about that, but it is, but it, there's, a, there's a side to which there may be so many unknowns that we can't get too much further than, than what we have from the documents. But it is something to think about. Why? Because men had to pay, I know that from the dealing with the men uh, um, apprentices, that, that there are always a, a problem paying these, uh, these fees so, and, and joining guild fees. And there are all these things that, that become part of the practical reality of becoming 
a professional artist, which then gets into the whole question of status and what is a professional, um, does uh, becoming a guild become part of the um, definition of becoming a professional artist? And it's, you mentioned Anna Maria von Schumann, it's very interesting because she does all of these art forms um, and is actually described as the Utrecht Minerva. I mean, so it has a kind of a recognition of her abilities were such that she received, as far as I know, an honorary um, guild membership from the Utrecht Guild in, in 1643. So it's, it was, that was quite an honor. And I think what I am, in, in my sort of ex background uh, efforts to become part of this panel discussion, <laughs> um, the number of women who receive accolades from poems and honorary things like that, uh, or portraits of women artists by other artists, it's extraordinary. And I think that there was a huge, um, my, under, my feeling is that there was a great excitement and recognition and acceptance of women artists, of women involved in the arts creative endeavors um, throughout that society. And it's something that I, I think ought to be celebrated about what the Dutch, how Dutch received the women as, within the important part of their culture. I think it's interesting because it seems to be the opposite of speaking to ex the, the idea of the exhibition that it wasn't e exceptionalism, that there were many more women uh, who were in the art world, but it doesn't take away from the individual characteristics of that particular woman artist and their talent and the sense that they are individually um, exceptional. Um, just going back to at least early in the century, I think it's probably more so than later in the century, just uh, thinking of uh, Samuel Amsink, who was writing the history of Harlem, description of Harlem in 1627, when he talks about the de Weber family of painters and mentions Maria and says, sort of um, paraphrasing here, whoever saw a painting by the hand of a daughter, so that there really is a sense that, oh, this is, you know, uh, unusual. And, and I think if it were really um, widespread, that, that sentence wouldn't make any sense. So, I mean, there, and they are, as Arthur pointed out, you know, really lauded or, you know, mentioned in some other way to, to say that this is, you know, that they are exceptional. So I think you have to sort of balance the two to say, right. Right. you know it's an exceptional thing but you know these um but it's not <laughs> so right right yeah and i think you know um i'm really interested to to look at the long 17th century and and to see just that you know you know were there in fact more and more women um artists and creators during you know as the as the era went on um and and what were the conditions, if so, that kind of allowed that? Um, but yeah, back back to the the point about kind of um, you know pr praising these women artists. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a double edged sword. Yes, that you know they're they're mentioned and they're and they're talked about and they're praised during their lifetimes, which makes it all the all the more unbelievable, right? That they've literally been written out of the the history books subsequent subsequently. Um, but I, I think, you know, some of the language that that contemporary language that is used to talk about them and to praise them is really this kind of um, exceptionalism speak, right, that it's, um, it's almost a little bit like, you know, oh my god, like, she's, she's so wonderful, she's so great, she's, you know, it's almost like, don't worry, guys. Like, they can't all do this. It's just her. She's just really, really good. <laughs> um, so we have so many questions. I want to try to get to some of them. Uh, it's um, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of them have come up on the chat, but some of them have been the question answer phase, which are, are not visible. So let me just um, one question is: is could women join the guild? So that's a pretty easy one. I can, um, that could, we don't have to um, spend a long time explaining, uh, going yes. through a long question. So 
who would like to answer? <laughs> well, yes, they could. Um, I don't think even in a place where there weren't women artists in the guild, there wasn't a rule that women couldn't be part of the guild. And we know, in fact, uh, just the example of Judith Leister that uh, she was uh, accepted as a member, as a master in the guild in 1633. So, um, so she's like fully credentialed and uh, not, I mean, a lot of women uh, did not, or, or the particular city that they were living in had different kinds of requirements. Like you had to be a native of the city or something like that. Great. Um, um, are you be will you be looking? I, Mrs. Ginny, I guess historiography of the women artists featured in your exhibition. How are their work received by their contemporaries? Of course, yes. That's that's a major uh, component and. Um, in the in the small show I did in 2019, um, I had two books. Uh, one of them was an edition of, of Haubrachen that I borrowed from the National Gallery of Art, um, open to the page on, on Maria Sibylla Marion. And another one was a book written by Anna Maria Vashorman herself. It was an, uh, an English translation of her, her work, The Learned Maid, uh, to demonstrate that, you know, these, these women were were published, were known, were talked about in contemporary sources during their lifetime. Because I think, you know, part of the, the story of this exhibition is going to have to be a, a reckoning um, of how and why they got left out of the history books. You know, it's not that they were working in obscurity during their lifetimes. It, people knew about them, um, you know, that's, that's why I included um, the addition of Halbrocken. And so why- Maybe you can explain who Halbrocken is. Yes, yeah, sorry. So Halbrocken uh, was a, a writer at the, the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th, who um, he's called the Dutch Vasari, right? So he's chronicling um, the lives of different artists um, in the Netherlands at the time. Um, and not mostly painters, but not just painters. Uh, he, he loved Johanna Carton Block. He had a, a huge uh, portrait of her in his edition. And he, you know, he went on at length about her work and the incredible skill involved in her work. Um, so yeah, that is definitely going to be an important part of the exhibition. And when did the most of the attributions of women artists to men occur? In some um, cases, almost immediately. Even yeah, I mean, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If it you was know, yeah. Um, so I have another question. Um, that's I think is a very good question, and that is something that's been uh, I think I was planning to talk about as well. Is is the sort of religious uh, devote devotion, religious symbolic quality of flowers and the inter the intertwined nature of devotion um, and understanding God, um, uh, God's greatness um, through the, um, by careful rendering of the bugs and plants and insects and all that, that you really come to understand who God is and what, uh, the, the wonders of his work. So that's something very clear, I think, in the Clara Painter's ex, um, painting at the National Gallery that you have a lot of symbolism of the flowers that are symbolically, can, there is a symbolism to religious symbolism to the flowers and to the, to the insects and bugs that have a kind of connective quality. And that is also true in the Hoofnagel um, pages that's so all intertwined, but you have not really discussed any of that, but is that part of, the desire to have this scientific naturalism as part of the, um, the way these still lives are, or flowers or botanical qualities of the works are, are rendered. I, Katie, I mean, that's probably yours. That, yeah, no, I, I can definitely speak to it. I think one of the things that's so wonderful about these paintings is that these two things can kind of exist simultaneously. They have these incredibly detailed, um, closely observed um, qualities, 
And they also can have this real moral um, significance as well. And that of course varies from painter to pa painter, example to example. And I think um, what's so interesting in part as the century kind of progresses and this interest kind of develops um, and there are microscopes, telescopes and these um, scientists are starting to kind of look um, to the interior of things that they didn't know existed. Um, kind of the unseen qualities um, of the natural world comes to kind of represent um, kind of the unseen. I've lost your, Katie, I can't, I can't ask. Can everybody hear Katie or not? No. Katie, we lost your uh, video, or audio. Oh, we lost everything. Maybe she's going to maybe she's uh -oh. it now. So um, another question, um, Jenny, this is probably for, for you from Alison Kettering, and that is, um, are you including amateur artists? What I think the whole question of uh, professional and amateur, what does that mean really? And are, um, you know, so what, what's the scope of artists falling outside the professional realm? Yes. Um, at, at Alison Kettering um, has long been a, uh, an inspiration of mine. I'm, I'm so humbled that um, she's, uh, she's watching right now and participating. Um, she's done some excellent work um, on this very question. And, you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting one when we think about um, women, because as um, others, uh, like Elizabeth Honig, who I also mentioned, have pointed out, you know, there's really this gray zone um, with women, you know, creating in a realm that is somewhere between the professional uh, and am amateur, not, not to mean that their work is not as good. I think our, our definition, our, our current definition of amateur is, you know, that it's something not quite as good as, you know, a professional whatever. But when we're talking about amateur in the 17th century, we're, we're really talking more about someone who is maybe not, um, you know, entirely reliant on um, the selling of their artwork for, uh, for economic gain, right? So it's usually women of the upper classes, um, like Anna Maria von Schormann, um, like the Vischer sisters who did glass engraving, um, who were really, you know, they uh, clearly they had a, a creative um, drive, right? It's not that they they had to um, do this work and sell it uh, to support themselves, but they they had this drive. They wanted this outlet, and so that was kind of the realm that they were operating in. One of the advantages, or the main advantage, of being a member of the guild was that you could have students and therefore get paid and you could sell your work. Um, and even though people might've sold work um, anyway, um, but they really weren't permitted to, you, they're, they're, unless you were a member True. of the guild. So, um, so if you met all the requirements, then it was to your advantage to, uh, you have to pay dues to the guild though, but it was to your advantage then to become a member. And I think, then you're right. If you're a upper class, if you don't need the money, why bother, you know, to be a member of the guild? Maybe it also has to do with the number of work somebody has produced. Um, that if you do one drawing, does that make you um, an amateur artist or just mm. a person who did a drawing? And um, that I I think that does matter if there's still a body of work. Um, whether a person is amateur or professional. Yeah. Um, some uh, very interesting comment from Menno Yonker is that at the, currently at the Maritz House, there are a lot of women, paintings of women artists, but also in the context of flower, um, um, other works, including uh, volumes of the Monarch's Atlas. So that's very nice. So yeah. it'd be good to have that. Uh, be in touch with them about that whole thing. Um, I am definitely heartened to see um, and, and in Dutch art as well as um, 
you know, other historical eras, um, the work of women being included more and more in exhibitions, um, not on women artists per se, but just, you know, as a matter of course. Yeah. Um, Jenny, uh, could you remind everybody about the plans, uh, when the show is planned to um, open and what your process currently is for how to bring it together? And is there anything out there that um, people listening can help you with? Um, well, if anyone would like to write me a check for a million dollars, that'd be great. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding, kind of. Um, yeah, so right now, um, you know, we're very much still in the planning stages. And I should reiterate that everything that you have seen on the screen today uh, is very much pie in the sky uh, wish list. Um, you mean the mayor's not coming? But, well, uh, maybe you can help me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so if you're from a museum who owns one of the objects that you can see today uh, and you haven't gotten a loan request from me, don't don't worry. I haven't. I have. We're not to that stage yet. Um, this is this is really just uh, very much in the uh, in the planning stages. And um, our, my museum, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, is actually currently closed at the moment for renovation until the fall of 2023. Uh, and so this exhibition of Dutch and Flemish women artists is planned for late 2025. And so. Um, Katie and I have our work cut out for us to get everything, um, you know, in line. Before then, I wanted to say that, you know, I have been reaching out individually to scholars in the fields um, who have been doing such tremendous work um, on women artists. And, a, you know, a big heartfelt thank you to Frema in particular for being uh, my particular role model in all of this. Um, you know, I was reading her work as an undergrad and it really obviously um, stuck with me. Um, I've also been in contact with Judith Norman at the University of Amsterdam, who's been doing amazing work um, on women as consumers of art and patrons of art with her students there. Um, I mean, there are just really so many tremendous scholars. Uh, there's so much work that's been done and so you know, it's my hope that as a, an art museum curator that, that I can um, help bring all of their fantastic findings uh, into the, you know, the broader public realm. I just wanted to add to that because I've noticed the names in the chat and uh, maybe people wouldn't recognize, other people might not recognize them, but there are a number of uh, major art historians who have been uh, involved as an audience here. And many of them also working on uh, women's history or women artists. And it seems to me that this is something where the your audience really may be able to help you or is working on, on parallel issues um, that, that perhaps there really should be something like this on a, a more advanced or um, a more specific area, whether it's the question of amateur or professional or the training of women, um, that it be you know a webinar that is just um, focused on something like that. And I think um, there are a number of, of uh, art historians who have been working on that, but for the most part, they're isolated. So this would be a really good way to get them together. Yeah. And yeah, together one, working on one thing I would love to do um, in conjunction with the exhibition is to have a symposium um, at the National Museum of Women and the Arts and invite, you know, these different scholars to, you know, present their work and to have a larger discussion. Great. Well, um, I think it's time we need to uh, wrap up, but I, I want to thank everybody so much for um, Ginny and Katie and Fremer for this, I think, wonderful discussion today and uh, looking into the future. But I also want to thank all of the participants, uh, all the listeners, uh, viewers who sent in um, questions and, and uh, comments in the chat. And we will get back to you with those that we weren't able to um, answer uh, or get to in this discussion. Um, but we really appreciate all of your thoughts and 
we would be delighted with uh, any thoughts you have in the future that you might want to pass on to to any of us. So many thanks. And Bob, um, welcome back. And thank you for, again, your introduction. And um, I guess you will give us our closing uh, remarks. Well, th thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, Ginny and Katie, thank you for all the hard work you put into this presentation. Um, thank you, Frima and Arthur, for your additional comments. 2025 seems like such a long time from now. Um, you've given us reason to invite you back on a regular basis uh, so that we can learn more about your progress in, in um, putting this exhibition together. So thank you so much um, for your contributions today to this wonderful webinar. And thank you to all of the audience out there for being with, with us here today. Um, we hope you'll stay in touch with the NAF. You can go to our website, uh, thenaf.org to learn about um, other future events, uh, other webinars, and we hope we'll see many of you uh, for our dinner on May 19. Thanks again very much, and thank you also to Jesse Conrad, who um, helped us with the technical uh, aspects today of today's webinar. Thank you, Jesse, and thanks again, and good afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.